On today's episode of Gathering the Kings. Out there in the world, every general contractor is facing the same weather, the same supply chain, the same subcontractor pool. The only thing we can do different is how we treat each other inside these four walls. You are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. What's up, everybody? Chaz Wolf and Gathering the Kings podcast. Today, we've got David Privatera here on the King stage. My brother, how are you? Hello. I'm Chaz. I am fantastic. I hope you are. I am. <clears throat> and guys in the audience, I want to just tell you, David and I have already established that if I ever need a fill-in, uh, that David would be willing to do it. I, this is the only other guest, really, that's come in with great voice, or as they say, perfect face for radio. Chaz, you are my plan B. So I hope this goes <laughs> just okay for you, but great for me. Yeah, exactly. I don't want, I don't want to, I don't wish you ill will, but, uh, I'm, but I'm ready. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. David, tell us what kind of business that you got, brother. I'm in the commercial general contracting world. So I've been in construction now. This, I did the math on it. It's scary. It's my 33rd year in the industry. You're not Hard a spring chicken. See now. Yes. I was only 40. I'm, I'm only 45. So I did it when I was 12. No, it's, I've been around, I've been on the block and the beard that, that maybe you can or cannot see was not this color when I started. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's definitely a lighter shade of gray. Hey, that's all right. The sage stage. We use the language in Gathering the Kings, this transition from warrior to king. And what comes after king, we don't talk about a whole bunch, is sage, where you've got all the knowledge and the wisdom and the gray hair. And so I think that uh, I think that you've already worn sage super well. It fits nice on you. But in all seriousness, I want to know, before we dive into your story, your background a little bit, I want to know what makes you tick. You're 33 years in. You're still doing it. You're here on a podcast. You're giving back. I, why? Why the heck are you doing it? Well, I'll tell you what, one of the things that surprises me is still how high energy I am for doing, doing this as long as I have. And one of the things about this industry is that the learning curve is exponential. I may know a lot, but there's so much more I've yet to learn. So part of that is, is, is to your point, it's the giving back aspect of it. But I just enjoy sharing life lessons and the things I did pretty good and things I did horribly and hoping to guide others to maybe not jump in the same pothole that I did. Yeah, yeah. And do you think that helping other people, because that's in essence what you're saying, you still do it now to help other people. Has that always been a driving factor for you? Has that grown over the course of time? Was it something different early on? Tell us that. No, it was different probably when I was younger. I always I always had that, that, that sense that uh, take care of others and if everybody else is okay, I'm okay at that point too. Yeah. And then as it evolved, as far as the leadership scale, I always talk about it as like a servant leadership a mindset, bottom up a type leadership. And we even, we even our graphics, our, our organizational chart, we do it upside down where I'm at the bottom and it goes up and out from there. Cause that's essentially how the organization works. It's the people, it's the managers and the field superintendents, it's the people that touch the clients more often than I ever will are the ones that are really the face of the company. As we already established, I have a face for radio anyway, so it's probably a better path. I love, I, you hear, obviously there's a book called servant leadership. There's this idea of top down or, or top up, but what you just said is that you write out your organizational chart upside down. Yeah, Where it, did you learn to do that? I mean, I love that. What's funny, it, it was probably came out of a jest moment where you said all things run downhill, right? And they land yeah. squarely on your lap. But essentially, that's what it was. When we started talking about really the people who, again, touch touch the public, touch the customers the most, it's the front line. And that's, again, that's who everybody, when they think of our company from a public perspective, that's who they're thinking of. So my job is to lift and support and push up and out. Versus me thinking I have to tug or pull up from behind. That's it's the wrong mm -hmm. mindset. And this it's worked more than it has. And there's, there are times when you have to, I think, pull along during the dark moments in the world. But sure. for the most part, it's about supporting and being there for others. And yeah. they will, they have and will continue to make me successful because they're the ones that are just out there making it happen every day. Yeah. The, <clears throat> just the visual picture that you've given of the front lines which really just means, like you said, it's there the interactions with the customer that could be on the sales side, it could be on the client fulfillment side, but either which way, it's like, they're the ones that the customer knows. 
And if it is in a traditional top-down structure, then what you're saying really is that you are the face and then everything trickles down from there. Like you're delegating down, which, okay, fine. We know we got to delegate. But really what I'm hearing you say is that what that means is that all everything comes to you and then it comes down as opposed to it coming to your team, the front lines, and then eventually those things get sifted and then just the things that you need end up on your lap at the end, as opposed to everything on your lap first. Am I understanding this philosophy correct? That's part of it. Again, I think from my perspective, is it, it, again, my legacy in this industry is not going to be the buildings that I was a part of. It's going to be, I think, the the people that I've helped develop and leaders that I've created through the lessons that I've learned. And again, to me, that's, again, that's that support. Think of it as a, I'm the foundation and I need to build people up. So yeah. that's this the way I just approach it. And it's the way I raised my family. It's the way I've helped grow this business. And it's just the way I've always led my life. And again, going back to where it all started, it's for me, it's that I just feel good and feel better when everybody around me is to the best of my ability taken care of. Yeah. And it's just, it yeah. just, that's just a, that's an innate wiring that I can't take any credit for. It's just the way, it's the way God made me. Yeah. It's something that I deeply resonate with and it's got me super intrigued. So we're going to have to continue the conversation, but I think for the listener too, I think there's, I think there's different types of people. I think there's people lead from the front and lead from the back. And I think there's benefits or maybe challenges to both the way that you've described, even just take, making sure everyone else is taken care of. I resonate with that. That's how I've run most of my companies, even thinking down to a Valentine's day at edible arrangements, where it's, if I'm in the store location, I'm literally going to make sure that everybody's got food before I, I would never grab a piece of pizza before I knew somebody didn't. And I think it's just the little things like that. I don't mean, I don't mean to pat myself on the back, but it's the same. That's just a super practical showing of the, of what I think that we're saying the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at company events, again, I will eat if not last second to last if it's a buffet style. That's just because yeah. again, I'm good and everybody should be, that's working really hard. If nothing else should be able to get what they want. And I am good with, with, I think leaders should eat last and that, and that's not, I didn't come up with somebody else came up with that, but that's real. And that's all part of it. And I think that sends a very subtle, but clear message. Yeah. hundred percent. I love it. Okay. So let's talk about just your story. Let's, how did you get into the business? Was it this business was the first one? Was there one before that? Just tell us about the beginning of your journey in business. Yeah, no, it's really been, again, going all the way back all those eons ago, I thought I wanted to be an architect and I learned very quickly in college that I was a bad designer and that's a pretty, <laughs> important, pretty important aspect of it. Again, it was less about, it was more, I had an engineering type mind where I was more focused sure. on the process and whatnot. Got out of school and, and <laughs> you talk about sage advice, I talk about my father and his advice was, okay, go find a job. And I'm like, okay, that's, I could do that. That, and I could read blueprints and I stumbled into it back in 1990 and uh, it just went from there. And I've held many different positions within the construction industry and I've worked for a handful of companies, but I've touched it my entire career. So there's never been a, I've dabbled in other things more on the side, but my main gig has always been building things. We really, in part of that starts with building teams and then eventually building product, which in this case is buildings of all shapes and sizes. Yeah. Yeah. I, the format there of thinking that you wanted to do one thing, but it really just lent to something slightly different. I think we can all relate to that a little bit, yeah. like a bump until you can finally get to the right place. So I, I want to know just a little bit more about business. Like why, how did you reading plans and working for a company, how did that eventually turn into you running your own business? Like there's a big difference between working for somebody and doing your own thing. What was that transition for you? What did that look like? It was, it happened about 17 years ago, a little bit over 17 years ago. And I was going through some personal change in my life and not necessarily the most positive experience, but did things happen? And I think there's always milepost markers in people's lives, things, moments where you have to take that leap of faith one way or the other. And uh, there were some things happening in one aspect of my life that I felt like it was time to, if I'm ever going to do something, now's the time to do it. And I had met my partner who had started this company actually about 10 years before we met. And I call it one of my leaps of faith when I took this chance because I had a young, I had young children and a young family, and it was a chance for me to maybe do something more. And I jumped in, not necessarily fully understanding my, most of my business acumen occurred after the leap. It wasn't sure. leading up to it. I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. And that's a, that. And I think there's a moment in time as you evolve as a professional, no matter what you're doing, where you get to that point where you begin to know what you don't know. And that's a really important time in a person's life. Because yeah, even to this day, I don't have all the answers, but I know where to go find them. And that's what I tell people. It's okay not to know. 
just go find out, seek higher counsel, whatever that might mean in the circumstances. And knowing, again, there are things that I wish I had known, but again, you learn lessons and all those things shape you as you go through your career. The entrepreneurial kind of bite didn't really happen until I got really probably post recession. So going back 10, 12 years ago now, when right. we all felt it at different times and we felt it right. later than I think other industries, because we work off backlog. And right. so it was, if it happened in 2008, for most of the world, we didn't feel it till late nine or early 10. And uh, those were some tough lessons to learn. Cause I don't think, I don't think anybody knew how deep and how wide that, that economic pullback was going to go. There's some valuable lessons. And then coming out of that though, when the pendulum began to swing back, Probably, again, 2011, 2012, it's never stopped. And that leads us to what we're in year three of the pandemic, if you still want to call it that. The catalyst that has been for our business is mind-boggling. I can't fully explain why. We were considered, our industry as a whole was considered essential at the beginning of this whole darn thing. And sure. I can argue <laughs> that I don't agree with that, but it was. And again, supply chain issues and labor issues and inflation, price escalations, all that stuff is real. But it hasn't stopped. And part of it is where we are in the country, in the southeast part of the U.S., Charlotte, North Carolina. It's a robust market. It's going to be for some time. So we're very blessed to be here. But it's our growth in the last two years has been incredible. And yeah. I don't give credit to the pandemic, but it was a catalyst that I just didn't yeah. didn't foresee. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay, I want to know along the lines here. Maybe go back to two thousand ten ish when it was a little bit of a crazy time for you, or maybe at the beginning. I just want to know not when it was super easy and cush and you're crushing it like you have been. Not to say that's easy, but I want to. I just want to go back to a different time, and I want to know of a good decision you made then that you can look back on now and be like, "Ooh, because I did that then." Something that's super strategic that has led us to where we are today. What is that? You know, one of the things that I think it has helped me, some people would say that I run fairly conservative as it relates to my business decisions. I just manage risk in it fairly well. And one of the things I've always, we, I think we all have egos. I think you have to have some level of an ego to get to any level of success, but keeping right. it in check and watching motivation. That's the word I ask. I said, what, why are we doing this? And I think making decisions and things that we didn't do at those moments in time. So take on a project with a maybe a questionable client or take on a project that maybe the financing was a little wonky, not mm -hmm. taking on those legacy issues and, that would have impacted our business for years to come paid us dividends. So having that 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 conservative risk management streak that runs through me um, has helped us uh, again. And again, as things get better and as you get a little bit older, a little bit wiser, you understand what risks really are out there. But in, in today's world, again, there's a whole bunch of new risks. So that's a big part of my role as I'm nurturing the next generation is really think about your motivation. Why are we doing this? We're not, are you, know, are you chasing, is it the right client? Is it the right location? Is it the right market segment? If you can't check all those boxes, then is it really worth doing? And if the answer is, I'm not sure, no, then it's time to just step away. And that's hard to do. It's hard to do when you're trying to keep the barn fed and signing new, uh, a big new right. deal and everybody gets excited, but you got to think about, you know, what if, and if you could plan for a worst case scenario, a reasonable worst case scenario, and you can see yourself navigating through it, then it's worth talking about. But if you can't tolerate what that might feel like, then it's not worth it. Yeah, no, you're hundred percent right. <clears throat> I want to try to just press into this a, a little bit because most of the listeners here today are in a place where they obviously want to grow but they have, they, they're calculating. It's probably a good word, right? They're wearing a lot of hats. They're making a lot of decisions, whether they realize it or not, they're probably still very much in the business every single day. And so it's tough to calculate risk from a very, what is this going to do to us later this year, next year, five years from now? Because like you said, they're just trying to get the barn fed. They're just trying to get the new contract. We're just trying to survive even a little bit. You know, like we're stuck in the mode. What would you say to that person who feels or is in the mode of that? How do they get to where, what you just said, having the poise? It, well, you, you said one very subtle thing. You said working in the business and carving the time and being intentional about working on the business. Just change, change that one letter from I to O. And that's something that that most smaller businesses don't do, whether it's they can't afford it time-wise or they're not sure of it, but taking the time. I have a cartoon on my wall. That says you can't read the label from inside the jar. And somebody sent that to me and I printed it and stuck it on my wall because it's very true. Again, it's if you're in it every day in the throes of it, taking a step back and looking at it and doing that, not necessarily 10 year plan, but that 12 month, 36 month planning session and looking at what's what moves I have to make. It, 
you have to be intentional. You have to force yourself to do it, put time on your calendar and do it. If you don't, it's going to keep you in that cycle of just working in the business. So how do you do that? It starts with a lesson that my parents taught me, I taught my kids, and I talk about all the time, is who you surround yourself with. You got to have the best people you could find. I've had a lot of good people, nice people, but not necessarily the right people around me throughout my career. And I learned that having, if you can find the blend of good people that are also the right people for your team, then that's when the magic begins to happen. But if you've, if you find yourself in the business consistently, you got to step back and ask yourself, if you're a control freak, a micromanager, then I don't know how to help you. But if you really want to do this for real, you got to be willing to let go a little bit and give others around you a chance to grow, but make sure you've got the best people you can possibly find at every level from the people that sit in the office with you to people that, you know, your vendors, subcontractors, your clients, you got to have the right clients. If you don't, it's not worth doing. Life's too short. Old school lesson, but surround yourself with the best people you can find in every aspect of your life. Yeah. The, uh, the working on versus in and scheduling the time. It's interesting because when I talk to entrepreneurs, whether it be six figure business owners who are looking to join our six figure gathering the Kings or our larger gathering the Kings, it's usually the conversation, the seven figure plus guys. When I say we have a three hour round table every month where it's scheduled and you're expected to be there and it's part of working on the business and they nod their head, just like you are now. Yep. That makes sense. Like it makes sense that I would schedule time to work on the business. I come and I strategize with other owners and I get ideas and inspiration and we solve some problems and then I can go back. But a lot of the smaller guys, they're three hours. How am I supposed to do that? How, how am I supposed to step away? I'm only <laughs> sleeping three hours. What are you talking about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now it's, it, yeah, it is not easy. And to get over that hump, but it, and it's all relative too, I think, to what you do. I think every industry is a little different. You, I actually, you know, for the longest time, I thought, okay, I've been doing this a long time. I, I know enough. I see counsel when I need to. But about 18 months ago, I went out and got myself a coach. I have a CEO coach. And I'm part of that as a peer advisory group that we meet once a month. And we spend four hours together. And it's 12, yeah. there's 12 of us business owners. Every industry is different. But when you sit down right. and start listening to others, it, the challenges and the opportunities are very similar. Maybe the margins are different and the, and the cadence of business is different. Yep. But at the end of the day, it's the same stuff. And I have, I'm kicking myself for only doing it for 18 months. I've been doing it for 18 years, but yeah, it's surround yourself with people in that kind of setting where it doesn't matter if they sell widgets and you sell construction services. It's very, the themes are very consistent and uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of that. Huge. Fan. Yep. hundred percent. Love it. Okay. Tell me about a bad decision. You said you, uh, you've got some good ones. Tell us about one of them. Some of the good decisions I make were born out of bad decisions. Policy is born out of things not going as planned. I think early in my tenure and in the role I'm in now, again, we were growing and I got out in front of my skis a little bit mm -hmm. and I did hire some people that weren't the right people. And yeah. it was beyond just not making money or losing money on a deal. It was more about the personal equity I burned through with clients. And for me, it was, I kept thinking that I had to, be the uh, back in the day, I played baseball. All right. And I'm going somewhere with this. So bear with me. I was a yeah. catcher and okay. I was trained to when there's nobody on base and there's a ground ball, you take off and you run down, you back up the first baseman. Okay. So I trained that and I did that and I did that and I did that and until a point where I realized the first baseman stopped bending down. Why? Because I was there to back them up and I was exhausted <laughs> and I got, and I take that and apply it to business is that I kept just backing everybody up and catching all the balls that were coming through. And it's opposed to me saying, why are so many balls getting through? And that so people just got, again, good people, maybe in some cases, not even good people and definitely just not the right people. So I have made mistakes hiring folks and aligning myself. I've gotten during desperate times back in the recession, I did do one small deal for a client that halfway through, I don't know why I did this. The view wasn't worth the climb. The juice was not worth the squeeze, better way to say it. That's right. And it was awful. Yeah. It was awful. The way I broach it in the company today is that, again, talking about people and is that out there in the world, every general contractor is facing the same weather, the same supply chain, the same subcontractor pool. The only thing we can do different is how we treat each other inside these four walls. And it's Bible around here. We, we are going to have the best people we can find and if we can't, well, if we can't find the right client, can't find the right subcontractors, can't find the right employees, we're not going to do it. It goes back to that motivation comment. I would rather have this company pull back a little bit for the right reasons and keep the quality of life of the people who are in the business at a higher level than mm -hmm. just try to plug the holes and keep bending down, backing up the first baseman, because that makes for some very long, long days.
Yeah. Yeah. There's no uh, sustainability with no, something sir. like that. No, sir. No. And it, it burns people out. This is a, it's a high stress business in the best of times. And you factor in all the different things we've been talking about. And it's just, yeah. uh, everybody's fuse is very short. Right. So I got to make sure that people are getting backed up in the right way, but I have a plenty of catchers to back up all the first basement, not just one. That's right. Yeah. I think that just something I want to point out to the listener is that it, I think we all as entrepreneurs know that we can run, you know, not necessarily like better, but we've got, we got more energy in the box or, or in the tank. And we just forget sometimes that every, they don't run like we do. And we expect them to run like we do. And what that does is not only it burns us out, but it burns them out, which then further burns us out because then they leave. And so I think right. that everything that what you're saying, as far as if you can create systems and then obviously give things away, like you're talking about, not just feeling like you have to be involved with everything. It's really not just the longevity of you. If you won't do it for you, at least do it for them. <laughs> exactly. No, and that's the one thing. I've been doing this a long time, but I still have some runway in front of me. And again, I sit here and think every day, what's next? I mean, I'm not saying I've hit a glass ceiling in my industry, but again, I'm, I, I run this company, the company, and maybe I've taken this company as far as I can take it. And maybe we need that fresh blood. So those are the things we're working on internally too, is that continuity and, and succession planning for the company. Because that's the legacy. If we can create a situation where this company lives on to another generation and beyond, and keeps growing in a better way with better people. And my job is just to, again, keep dropping down the York chart a little bit and then right. eventually kind of just stay out of the way. That's my goal really in simple, in its most simplest terms is that get people ready for that next chapter and then just stay out of the way and let them run, let them yeah. run and let them set the guardrails. They're going to bang off of them. Those are the best lessons you learn is when you bang off the guardrail. My job is to keep them going off of the ditch. That yeah. makes sense. 100%. I love it. What kind of process or maybe even discipline do you have around making decisions now? So we've gone through your good and bad back then. What about now? You're at this successful point where you're even considering succession. What type of discipline do you find around decision making? Build a smart room. Again, have people in the room with different perspectives. I think you need that diversity of thinking. If we all thought the same way, we'd be rowing the boat in a circle, right? So having people in the room that can see things from different perspectives. Again, there's there is there are some wildly talented people out there and several of them work in this organization. Make it more of a set the standards and, and Ultimately, we're not a democracy, but it, the way on the term we use is meritocracy. If people are great people and can grow, give them a chance to grow, but make sure the room is really smart and talk through things and gain those perspectives. And then if everybody's nodding their head, yes, and that's a reason to move forward. What would you say? You've mentioned having great people, the best people, you fill the room with smart people. I can only imagine when you do that, obviously the conversation is rich and the people respect the other person across the table. And they're like, wow, like I'm, not only do I feel great, but then I feel great because that person is a high caliber individual and it's just like a rising tide. But speaking to the person who's listening right now, who's thinking, I, I can't afford an A player or I can't afford multiple A players. I'm just trying to find a laborer or whatever. Like, How do they get to that mentality where they're trying to fill a room of A pay people or, or smart people to have those types of conversations when they're stuck or at least they feel stuck at the current moment where they are? It's funny. Two weeks ago, we had that peer advisory group meeting, and there was one gentleman who's in the group, and his approach is always go get the business first and then find the people. And I went at him a little bit saying, because I think that's backwards. You will sell with more confidence and you will be more successful and you will see a higher return on your investment if you build the right team and then go after the opportunities. Again, it, that doesn't mean that an opportunistic moment can't happen and you have to react to it. But if you're that's tactical. But if you want to be strategic, you got to be willing to and start with one. You don't have to find a whole team. If you have one person, maybe there's a person team now that, okay, if at the end of the day, if you have a question or something that's going on, who do you pivot to? If there's nobody there, then, it, then it's time to think about starting with that one person. But if there's somebody in your organization now that you trust, because it starts with that, starts right. with, you have to, and that doesn't come instantly. I think you can like somebody and they have a good track record and all those things, but until a true measure of a person is how they behave when things are difficult. It's really easy to be fun and jovial and celebrate when things are good. Yeah. But if things are difficult and how, how people behave during those moments when things are not going as planned, that's the true measure of a person. And if you've been in the trenches with somebody and they've stood by you, maybe they were waiting for you to make a decision, but they were with you, start there. But you have to be willing, again, to give up a little bit in order to go up. That's don't know any other way to do it. I have lived, had to react in a tactical way. And that works for the short term, but a long term strategy is build that, build it with one person that with the elect, that confidant 
at that point, I think you'll, you, again, you'll be able to sell with more confidence. You'll tend to have more consistent returns. And maybe it'll be a slower rise, sure. but that's okay. It's, yeah, life is short. I've said that, but it's a long road. There's a lot of runway out there. And yeah. if you think, yeah. I don't care what you do, if it's transactional and it's going to be a one hit and you're done, then this is probably not the right conversation for you. But if you want to have a long-term plan and you want to be able to exit with some level of quality of life, just turn yeah. off the lights and lock in the door, you got to start that thinking now and it, and just be slow and steady. Again, I wish I had a more profound way to say it, but I think yeah. that's ultimately it. Is that build, build it first and then the opportunities will come versus reacting or waiting until that great deal comes along and then I'll hire somebody. I think you'd be waiting a long time if you approach it that way. Yeah. And then just to hammer from that other guy's perspective, he's obviously got a sales background. That's what he's comfortable with. And I would say that almost every sales background guy is going to lean to, let me just go get the client and then I'll figure it out, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But strategically, knowing what I know now, because that's how I, let's just, run. <laughs> we'll create a mess. And then, and through the mess, we'll create systems. And there's, and again, I think that's how the majority of business owners do it, but I'm not necessarily saying it's the best way, the well thought out, especially once so that's what Dave is talking about right now is that he's been through the fire. I've been through the fire. And even with gathering the Kings, this is a little bit more of a passion project than anything. Yes. We have a mastermind group that's peer to peer advisory. Yes. We charge for that. Like it's a business, but I've been able to look at how we're building this with all of my other business experience and be like, okay, who do I need? Who are the people? Yeah. And it's okay that it's, it's more strategic now. And it's a little bit slow. I got a little bit more poise. Of course, I want things to go fast, but I want real relationships. I want a real machine on the inside where people are like, this is great. As opposed to, wow, this is a really big mess. <laughs> Although it still feels like that. I'm sure to some people in every one of our businesses, you are who you are and you're not going to change overnight. And if you're wired that way, and trust me, I, I, I can say these things now, but there were times where I would outrun my blocking because I was yeah. young and aggressive and wanted to get something going. That's right. But again, the most successful running backs in the NFL do better when they wait for their blockers to get out in front of them versus yeah. trying to outrun everybody. So, so true. Lots of sports analogies. Baseball, now football, what's next? I know. What, you're the, uh, you're the uh, business yeah. sports coach. <laughs> I don't know about all that. I don't know about all that. Okay, I want to know, I'm going to come at you a different angle here with some speed round questions. I want to know right. if you had to dwindle your entire business down to one trackable metric, something that you would track forever and ever and you only get to pick one, what would it be? You know, I thought about this. You know, we we have so many KPIs that we utilize now and all these That's different right. metrics that we look at. So it, to me, it's more about, I wish there was a way I could measure an associate's personal stress level. I think there's so many things happening in people's personal lives. We want to separate, well, that's personal versus business. That's bull. Yeah. Yeah. The world is intertwined. Our work life and our personal life are intertwined, especially the last couple of years with work from home and things of that nature. So to really have the, you know, having a, empathy gauge to make sure I fully understand what people are dealing with because everybody's dealing with something and some people hide it really well. Some others just are, you can read it as they walk in the room, but have, I wish I had a better understanding of what people were dealing with. Not that I could solve their problems and maybe that's not my business, but at least I have an understanding and have that empathetic view of things. And I wish, and again, that's so easy to say and so hard to make happen, but I think yeah. everybody's dealing with so many unique things in today's world at so many levels that if we can find a way to understand that, it doesn't mean we solve their problems for them, but at least it gives us a, a different perspective. Yeah, this is interesting. I was just this past weekend talking with my my dad and stepmom about the same topic, but my sister, one of my sisters is a counselor and she spent some time in a school first and she's going on to do some other counseling things. But this is the topic inside the school where she was talking about mental health and different things that are going on with different students. And the fact that someone was bringing items to school that they were going to hurt themselves with, like that, that nobody knew that, but she knew that because that's what her role was. And without sharing those things, but really giving the opportunity to speak up and say, Hey, these things are happening. And so then I immediately go to 50 years ago, a hundred years ago, when everybody was on a farm, was this really a concern? And that's how just my simplistic mind, like, is it, are we really dealing with this? But a lot has changed. Maybe we don't have to go out and milk cows anymore, but, but social media or the fact that certain pleasures or certain even amenities that we do have that causes us to either think or not have certain things that maybe they didn't have a hundred years ago or 200 years ago. So I think that the conversation to your point of, if I know what's happening inside of my people, it can just, it can help you lead better is really what I'm hearing you say. Absolutely. And to your point, I think it, 
things are changing at a much faster pace. Just right. think about where we were three years ago and three years ago, pandemic, I can't even spell pandemic and look at us now, right. look how the world has evolved and things between technology and innovation and things like social media and just, it, there's, there's so many platforms now it's going to, the world is going to keep evolving at a more rapid pace. I don't know what the turn rate's going to be, but it's going to be faster. And I think what we're dealing with today 10 years from now, it's going to be a completely different world. Again, I think it'd be a lot of positive things, but there'd be some problems that this next generation is going to have to deal with that I can't even contemplate right now. Yeah, 100%. What book would you recommend, David, for a six-figure business owner to read? All right. See, I'm staying in a good vein here. So talk about coaching and sports. So the book is called Trillion Dollar Coach. Okay. okay? And it's a biography about a guy named Bill Campbell. And Bill Campbell, and I won't do it justice, but it was written by three former execs for Google. Bill Campbell was a guy, he was a, a football player at an Ivy League uh, school, ended up becoming the coach there. And then from there, springboard, and ended up and went from the East all the way out to Silicon Valley and became this mentor and coach for people at Google, at Facebook, at Apple. And his legacy, and again, he, the people that he's worked with, and he was a, I guess he was a very, he was a Yankee, so he was very crude. I can relate to that. He was very crude, and but very straightforward and just really built teams. And again, I'm not doing it just, but it's a phenomenal book. And it's a, it's stories. It's not a, it's a biography in a sense, but it's people telling their experiences working with Bill Campbell. And it's awesome. And I've been able to glean so many pearls of wisdom from it. So I recommend it very highly. That's trillion great. dollar coach. Yeah. That's perfect. We'll put it in the show notes as well. People can click on it and get a purchase. It, you've already talked about obviously the peer advisory and it sounds pretty similar to the setup that we have with Gathering Kings, but I want to know, normally my question is, what do you think about it? Obviously you already do it. What would you say to the person listening today who doesn't do it? Whether it's something local or an event that they need to go to or a mastermind, they just haven't, they don't. What would you say to that person? I Back to the ego comment I made earlier in the conversation, as a business owner, it's hard to be vulnerable. And when you're dealing with stuff that's beyond you, and in today's world, we're all dealing with things that are beyond us. There are people that are just like you out there and dealing with things, again, different industries, different parts of the world, whatever the case may be, but there's a common thread. And if you can allow yourself to be a little bit vulnerable and put it out there, It'll come back to you in waves. And it's amazing to me, the part of it is that I hear these common thread type issues from my peers and I'm dealing with the same thing inside my own world. But when I hear for them, I have all the clarity on the, in the world to be able to give them <laughs> so you know, true. those thoughts and those pearls of wisdom and those, and those uh, simple things in my mind. Yet I turn yeah. the mirror on, look at myself and go, dummy, why aren't you doing that kind of thing? True. It's amazing. So it, it, just put a little bit out there and you'd be amazed how much will come back. And most people are fear is too strong, but I think it is a level of apprehension when it's, when you hear the word vulnerable, it means, oh my God, I'm exposing myself and they're going to see right. all my flaws. Guess what, man? We all have chinks in the armor. We've all banged off the guardrail. And right. uh, the good news is you're not alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that if we keep the mindset of, do we actually want to be better? Do we want to reach the potential or do we want to go to the next level or do we just really want to stay here and make it seem like we we want to go to the next level because if you do want to go to the next level it usually takes some exposing and that's again that sounds aggressive but it's like i just need somebody to be able to go you know what i see you doing this and you probably don't notice it but if you this or that or switch that around or reverse engineer it it just it allows for a completely new way of thinking so yeah it, it takes intentionality you have to be deliberate and right. once you force yourself down that path a little bit before you know it you're just you're strumming along and you look forward to those moments. I look forward. I'm actually, I'm in, a, I'm in a personal group and a business group, and I get things out of both of them. And some I talk and some I do mostly listening. I think each time you have to read the room, but it's been awesome. And again, sometimes it just takes, I think you got to get to a certain point in life. But yeah, if you're going through the motions, then just stop wasting your time and your money. And just, it is what it is. But if exactly. you really want to make a change, be deliberate about it. Be deliberate. Yeah. It's good. Last question here for you, David. If you lost it all, what would you do? I'm gonna I'm gonna host your podcast when you. <laughs> I told you that already. Come on, Plan B. Um, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, it's so hard to comprehend losing everything. Again, I've been doing this for so long. I still have again a lot of energy, so I would do something, at least something different. I would never go in the food and beverage business, but I love to cook. And my family says you should open a restaurant. I'm like, no, I shouldn't. No way. Crazy, <laughs> out of your minds. Again, I think my wife says that I, when I 
go on to my next chapter, whatever that might look like. She's like, you should be a consultant. I'm like, well, I hate that word consultant. But I get asked all the time for people that I'm doing business with, people that I know, on things I'm not even part of, just to pick my brain. And I willingly do it. So I'd be a bad consultant because I wouldn't make any money doing it. But I go back to there, there's two moments in my work life where I'm at my happiest and one of my most energized. And that's when I'm selling to a client or really for me, selling is helping a client figure out a problem because they've come with a project. A project is a problem and helping them think through it and navigate it and do it with the same way I'm speaking with you now with no no preconceived notions of success on it. And the second thing is when I'm talking to young people and doing some recruiting, because that's one of the things I like to at least have a phone call with every potential candidate for 30 minutes on the phone, just want to break the ice yep. and make them be comfortable with, hey, I, I'm the top guy and you can get along with me. You can get along with anybody in this company. And just in helping young people think about what that next chapter for them might look like. So I think there's something in that world of business development slash recruiting slash, I guess, cooking. I don't know. I made that up. But at that end, and I love to talk. Dream job would be somebody to pay me just to do what I'm doing now with you. Yeah. I'd be like, man, it have to be a lot too. I'm not looking for a huge profit center, just to break even kind just of Just enough. There enough might, to there get might by. be a, a spot in the podcasting world oh, for you. Um, okay. we, you never know. There, there could be, uh, there could be some advisory uh, roles open up within gathering the Kings as well, as we continue to grow that, that, that could be a fun. Overlap Jess, keep, for sure. Please keep me in mind. Then. I think that, I think that it would be, it would be a pleasure to just continue a conversation. I think that when like-minded guys rub shoulders, man, it's just, I love the ideas that flow. And I've done at this point, I've met slash done deals with slash who knows with podcast guests. And so it really is a pretty incredible thing just to, when you put two people together in the room and you just see what happens. Right. David, I, I want to know, how can the listener connect with you? I want them to have the chance to have the same access. No, I appreciate that. The best way is probably through LinkedIn. I mean, that's the, I'm not a huge social media person personally, but through, I'm probably most active on LinkedIn from a business perspective. So yeah, they, I sent a, a, a link to my profile. So I welcome people to reach out and that's a good way to at least start the conversation. And that's really how I met you was through LinkedIn. So yeah. it does, work. It does um, work. But back to your point, I think one thing I want to say is that people do business with people that they like. So if you can, if you can get, just right with, start with people that you like, and then if you can build that trust, man, oh man, that's when the magic begins to happen. Yeah, hundred percent. That's the best way is LinkedIn. I'd start there. I love it. I love it. You have been absolutely incredible, and much more. You're in the king stage. I know you got that sage wisdom in there, but man, you've been very kingly here today. In all seriousness, thank you. Just incredible insight, business perspective, and story. So thank you. We wish you nothing but blessing and success on you and your family. Thank you for being here. Pleasure was mine. Thank you so much, Chas. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries, and now interviewing over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1,000 kings, specifically who are grateful, but not done. We're intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family, and communities. And here's what we believe, that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.